Good evening. I am uh, Digvid Jais, Vice President of Research and International at the University of Manitoba. Uh, welcome you to the first of this year's uh, uh, Cafe Scientific. Uh, these cafes uh, are the initiative from uh, my office. We started these uh, now a few years ago, almost uh, coming to a dec uh, the 10 years. And the purpose of the cafes is to bring the University of Manitoba researchers uh, to the community in a more comfortable setting. And Janine, who is the uh, organizer of these events, tells me the bookstore with the coffee, cookies, and crackers is the best way to have the comfortable setting. So uh, uh, we have today, we have a very exciting and relevant topic. Uh, for discussion, uh, high-tech humans exploring the limitless potential of technology. And you can uh, ask uh, tough questions, uh, simple questions. You play a major role and uh, our moderator would explain how you would play the role in, uh, in, in, the, in the cafe. So at this time, I, I want to introduce your moderator uh, to you this evening. And uh, uh, she will give you more ground rules and uh, guide the discussion this evening. Uh, Dr. Jaina Lutfia uh, is a professor in the Department of Educational Administration, Foundations and Psychology in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Lutfia's long-standing research interest has been identifying and examining the factors that help or hinder the valued social participation of individuals with intellectual disabilities in community life, including where individuals live, go to school, work, and take part in recreational activities. She has facilitated the participation of individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities in the research process, both as participants and in helping determine research goals and questions. In 2013, with her colleague uh, Karen Swartz, she began a study that focuses on how individuals with the intellectual disabilities understand the concept of human rights and how uh, they are supported to learn and exercise these rights. Since 2015, she has served as director of the Peace and Conflict Graduate Studies Program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zain Amir. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Dyes, for that introduction. So welcome. I will be the moderator for our get-together this evening. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview about the process that will follow. So each of our panelists, who I'll introduce in a minute, will speak for about five minutes on their uh, topic uh, for the discussion tonight. And after all of the panelists have spoken, I will open the floor up for discussion and for questions. I will be passing this wireless microphone around so that everyone else can hear what you have to say. This evening's panel presentations are being video recorded for later uploading onto the Café Scientifique website. A link to the video will be posted at the umanitoba.ca Café Scientifique website next week. I will take the last question around 8.25 and then wrap things up for the evening. As you've already seen, there are refreshments on the side table with some materials. Please feel free to help yourself during the evening. And you will notice that there are some evaluation forms on your chairs. And we would really appreciate it if you were able to fill these out and then leave them on the table over here at the end of the evening. Sometimes you just need three hands. Okay, that brings me to uh, the introductions of the panel this evening. The first uh, closest to me is Dr. Kelly Main. And Kelly is the department head and associate professor of marketing at the I.H. Asper School of Business at the University of Manitoba. She received her M.A. in Social Psychology from the U of M and a Ph.D. Marketing from the University of British Columbia. Her primary stream of research is at the intersection of marketing and psychology, exploring the rational and irrational judgment processes that influence consumer behavior. Mr. Corey King, in the middle, is the chief executive artist and co-founder of Zenfree Incorporated, a company that merges art, technology, and business. As an award-winning storyteller, game developer, and producer, 
This University of Manitoba alumnus speaks at conferences around the world and has garnered worldwide press attention and accolades. Based in Winnipeg, Corey has attracted over $2 million in funding, was the 2016 recipient of the Future Leaders of Manitoba Award, and was named one of CBC Manitoba's Future 40. His most recent game was nominated for two Canadian Video Game Awards. And then uh, on my far left is Dr. Andrea Bunt. And she's an Associate Professor in Computer Science, Faculty of Science at the University of Manitoba, where she also co-directs the Human Computer Interaction Lab. Her research is in the areas of human computer interaction and intelligent interactive systems, with an emphasis on issues surrounding feature-rich software, community-authored help resources, and computing experiences in rural and remote communities. So, I'd like you all to welcome our panelists for this evening. Thank you, Zaina. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight is some research that I've been doing with a former graduate student of mine. His name is Ray Lavoie, and he's now an assistant professor at Merrimack University down in the States. And what we were interested in in some of the research we did together was the way that people can experience a psychological state called flow and how technology can sometimes impact their experience of that flow state. So flow is considered a very positive psychological experience. It's considered to be very rewarding and a very enjoyable state. And so what we've been trying to do in our research is to understand some of the ways that we can facilitate people to experience flow. Now flow has two main constructs that are related to it that help it arise. The first one is fluency and the second one is absorption. So fluency is people's perceived ease of or familiarity with a particular task. So if it's easy or if I'm familiar with it, that experience will be fluent and it'll be easier for me to start to enjoy it and move forward through the task. Absorption is about being able to narrow the focus of attention down onto those elements of the task. And that's where you, there's this narrowing of attention and you sort of lose track of the other thoughts. And so what we've been doing in our research is understanding some of the ways that we can experience flow in using technology. And so we've been focused on trying to either try and make the fluency aspect of flow, of flow sorry, more likely to occur, or for the absorption elements of flow to be more likely to occur. So in one of the studies that we've run, we've been looking at people listening to music online. And so sometimes what we might do is encounter new music genres throughout our experiences. Music that we haven't heard before, we haven't been exposed to. And so one of the things that we wanted to find out is how can we help people experience flow when they're listening to this music that they've never heard before. And so one of the things that we found in our research was just giving people information about the music itself. Not necessarily about the song, but just giving them some information helped them feel that, that fluency part and it helped them get absorbed into the song to experience that positive state that we call flow. In other research, we've looked at uh, playing online games, for example. So playing a Sudoku or any kind of online game you might be doing. And trying to understand how people can experience flow in that context. So we've looked at things like, if the task is too difficult, then it makes it more difficult to experience flow. Because the fluency part is not there. If the game is too hard, then you're not going to experience that fluency aspect that will lead to that flow experience. We've also looked at flow in the context of both augmented reality video games as well as virtual reality video games. And that's where we've done some, um, some work with Corey. And so what we've been trying to understand is how people can experience flow in these online gaming experiences. And so we use those same two core constructs. We try to make the experience fluent for people to help them to become absorbed. So some of the things that help make that experience more fluent is just providing information about the technology itself or providing information, information about the game. And that will help with that fluency experience. And then we need people to become absorbed. And so one of the things that thwarts that absorption part is being distracted. Being distracted because it will pull your attention away from the task. And that will make it very difficult to experience that positive feeling of flow. Now, the way that I've described flow so far and how it could occur in some of these kind of technological interactions is has a very positive spin. So flow has positive consequences, it's 
uh, a good feeling, it has positive outcomes, but some of our research has also been looking at if it could have a negative outcome. So the other context that we've looked at is online gambling. And so there you can see how flow might come forward when the gambling uh, game that you're playing is very easy and it feels like you're progressing through the task, you become absorbed, and so you can experience flow when you're gambling in these online contexts. And what we found is that that leads to a couple of negative outcomes. So it makes people more likely to spend more time gambling, far more time than they expected to, and that tends to also lead them to spend more money. And so that's some of the research that we've been doing in our lab. Thank you. Go ahead. Don't need my permission. Um, all right, so I do all sorts of weird and crazy things. I pretty much make a living going wherever I feel passionate about with me and my wife and my business partner. Um, I'll try to keep this as research focused because I've done research uh, here, I've done it over here, I've done it with the robotics lab because I'm just uh, fascinated by a lot of stuff. As a general background, um, you know, I've worked in augmented reality, I'm currently working in virtual reality. The augmented reality research we did with her was for a game that was a Pokemon Go-like game that came out an entire year before Pokemon Go. And uh, imagine explaining to the audience location-based augmented reality before Pokemon Go. It was pretty impossible, honestly. Um, um, the, the research we have most recently done with Ray actually involves uh, things like ethics. So um, we, we did a project about moral residue. Uh, and this is something that's a concern for me because I want to tell stories and I want to move people in virtual reality. But if virtual reality has a stronger moral residue, as in you feel the situation worse, it's not quite the same, you know, perhaps, in theory, watching a murder in a movie, you know, Robert De Niro shoots somebody, then you are in a cafeteria in a virtual scene and you watch the murder and you feel like you're actually present. Is that worse? That's what the research was about. Because we don't want to necessarily have people leave traumatized by our stories. We want them to enjoy the stories, be moved emotionally by the stories, because I believe video games, and any, because I'm not really a video game guy, that's what I'm most known for now, but I'm a storyteller and an artist and I want to move people. Um, but is there dangers? So with the flow test, what we did with that one, or not the flow test, the moral residue test, was we took a narrative um, where there was sort of a, a you get to know a person, um, you know, they're telling you about all the problems in their life, there's an interlude where you learn in a police report that they've done something kind of terrible. And we actually even did a study to realize how terrible or not terrible we could make it. Uh, because if you make it too terrible, people's judgment calls are going to be obvious. They're going to say, well, throw that guy in jail. If you make it too easy, no one's going to do anything. So you have to find this weird, fine line of it's morally ambiguous. And we did a text-based version of that with pictures, sort of like just a point click, versus a virtual reality scene to determine did virtual reality actually have a greater impact on people. And, um, I mean, so far it seems like that is the case that it does have, which has ramification for me because I'm doing a video game where you're the last human taxi driver in the future and you're talking to passengers and some of them are refugees, some of them are all kinds of things. And we want people to engage and make moral judgments, but we don't want people to be traumatized. I know um, similar things we've done is I've worked with the robotics lab where we compared AR uh, robotics to each other to see like what's more emotionally moving for people. Um, versus animation, um, and we're currently doing a study about uh, load bearing. So like, you know, how many tasks, multitasking is hard for everybody, right? Lots of people think it's not, and they text and drive and they get killed. But um, generally people sort of miss underestimate what it is, but we were testing, does virtu what's the mental load of virtual reality? How much can you be doing like a menial activity, like sorting colors, list and then listening to a separate conversation and responding? Uh, that was important for us because as much as virtual reality is super immersive, uh, it's not as good as real life. I have more degrees of vision here, I can hear you better, I can speak. Uh, like there's, you know, a smell, there's all kinds of things. I'm not limited by these tiny pixels, you know, uh, like, uh, virtual reality has a limit in terms of its uh, uh, resolution. Um, and, and so what you find is it's actually Task, multitask management in virtual reality, despite you being in this limitless virtual space, we don't have the research in yet, but I'm feeling, based on my game design sensibilities, that it's much harder to do multiple things in virtual reality, and I feel like it's probably not scientifically, opinion only, based on the fact that your sensory inputs aren't as good. You're fully immersed, but you're fully immersed as if you have one hand tied behind your back, so to speak. You know, it's like, I only have one eye open. Yeah, I feel like I'm really in this world, but I'm not fully cognizant. The other things I'm personally interested in, so if anyone wants to talk to me about this, is how technology affects identity and who we are as people. 
what happens if I can be virtually, simultaneously look like a giant gorilla, for all the fans who love giant gorillas, look like a woman, for people who like to be cross-dressers, and maybe I like to be a cross-dresser, and everyone in between doesn't know the difference. I can exist in multiple spaces simultaneously as different people in different identities. That's not here yet, but I feel like that's going to come. So you could be in an office space, this guy looks like Batman, I look like Robin, and nobody else at the business table has any idea, because we're all in that same connected space. Um, simultaneously, what happens if we have a chip in our brains and you can send a thought to your spouse? What does that do for the culture? What does that do for identity? You know, the more we are able to be malleable about who we are, the more we need to be able to think, who do we want to be? And what does that mean? And what are the ramifications? So as an artist, that's a, a thought and an idea that really uh, I think about a lot. But generally, you can ask me about like anything. I don't know. I, I get to just non-research-wise have opinions and thoughts, and uh, hopefully they're useful to people. Okay, um, so I, I want to take a minute first to explain my, what my research area is. So it's human-computer interaction, and, and I'm a trained computer scientist who, um, partway through grad school, discovered that the problems that I was most interested in are, are things where we, we look at both technological advances and humans uh, simultaneously, right? So, you know, there's so many great things that we can do now with technology, new devices, new algorithms, but also really hand-in-hand uh, -hand understanding how those advances ultimately impact the people that, that use them. Um, so, there are two things that I wanted to talk about um, that I think we need to sort of always keep in mind as, as this world is advancing. Um, one is, you know, just how difficult a lot of these complex systems that, that people can now you know, experience with technology, how difficult it is to learn them. Uh, and, and what's made this even more challenging is the way that we learn about what technology can do for us has really changed. Um, so, you know, 20 years ago, you would buy a new piece of software or, or a new device or something, and it would come with this manual, this actual physical manual that, you know, was professionally authored, it was curated, and you can actually, you know, sit down and, and read that. And for the most part, they either, those either don't exist as resources anymore, or people have really changed their habits. So now they go online and they search for, for community-generated content that, you know, other users of the software or, or systems have, have authored. And so it's great that there's so much out there, but it can be really hard to find what you're looking for, and um, it's not always great great quality, right? It's not always going to be at the level you need or clear or, and that kind of thing. So, so my group has done a lot of work of I'm trying to think of ways that we can, technology can get clever about how it finds resources for people and also providing tools to let communities work together to, to refine some of these resources that are out there. Um, so people love to share their knowledge on the internet, and we've probably all experienced that. And so we're, we're looking at ways that we can actually harness that knowledge to make it easier for people to learn the technology that they're using. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention that's a big uh, focus in my lab is just understanding and accommodating individual differences. Uh, with respect to technology use. So um, most technology is still designed with what I would call a one-size-fits-all a one model, which, you know, if you've ever purchased an item of clothing that says one-size-fits-all, you're, you're typically pretty skeptical that, that that can be the case, right? Um, just like with, with clothing, like with a hat, uh, technology is usually d designed with a particular user group and profile in mind um, and it's now being used uh, really widely. So, you know, things that we know can matter. Um, different people have different tasks that they want to do with software, that, you know, different um, expertise that they're bringing in, you know, def definitely different cognitive and, and physical abilities. Um, and I've also done some work in uh, rural communities. So if you drive a, a few hundred kilometers, or even sometimes a hundred kilometers outside of Winnipeg, um, some people still have really poor quality internet. It's slow, it's unstable, and if you get quite far north, it's just not, not there at all. Uh, and we use technology these days that often really assumes this constant level of, of connectivity. Um, so we have more sort of questions in that space, I think, than answers right now. We, we know that these differences matter. 
Um, there's some opportunity to, to give people tools so that they can customize and adjust the software to, to their own needs. There are also some interesting opportunities with machine learning advances now to sort of automatically detect you know, things that people might want to do with software or their current um, resource constraints and, and so on. So that's another area that we're really excited about. Thank you all very, very much, sticking to pretty much five minutes each. Okay, so we're going to open up for, uh, the, for discussion and comments. You can address your questions to a, a one person or uh, leave it more open. And I'll be walking around and, and handing around the mic for you. And please feel free if you want to come up and get something to drink or a snack, please do so during the conversation. Okay, who'd like to start? I have a big voice, I will need that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your names. I ran out to go check out the question for the uh, introduce, introducing fellow. Um, you so know what? I'm, I'm going to ask yeah. you to use right. the mic because right. I think people my might not so hear. Large oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. so my first question is for um, the, the first speaker. Yeah, I'm Kelly. I'm Kelly. Kelly, okay, sorry. And I wrote it down to make sure I get this clear. Um, so you're saying uh, you said information helps flow. I interpreted that you said. Okay. Information helps flow, and uh, so I'm saying. So I'm asking, does this suggest that cognition helps um, an essential emotional experience? So I'm suggesting that you said that essentially uh, cognition helps the emotional state. Mm -hmm. um, that's my question, and I'm challenging that as an idea as well. <laughs> okay. I have a second question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think based on our research that that's part of what we're seeing because although flow is a feeling state, there are elements that lead up to it that aren't purely based on feelings. So the fluency part that I talked about does have a feeling base to it, right? It's that feeling that things are easy, but it's what comes before that that might not actually be feeling related. So in our, some of our research, what we've done is we've given them information like about the genre of the song. We've asked them whether they've looked up information prior to going to an event. So that's some of the other research that we do that's not with a technological focus. We've, uh, in the research with Corey, we've given people information about what augmented reality technology is. And that information that we give to them does seem to lead to those feelings that it's easier to, to work with the task, it's easier to listen to the music, it's easily, easier to use the augmented reality game. And then for those people, they are more likely to experience that positive feeling of flow. So I think if I've interpreted your question the right way, that, that there is sort of that link in this case. But isn't it that powerful um, preconceived idea, this uh, trying to avoid cognitive dissonance, this whole powerful psychological thing of protecting our ego, all that, um, I mean, politically we see it all over the place these days, um, is not affected by information? And unless I'm mixing apples and oranges here. So I'm well, thinking that people have this, this idea about themselves and they enjoy a piece of art. False information is still information. I thought that voice is coming from somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> I mean, you can have completely false beliefs, that's still an information. You could call it corrupted data, but you could still hold a belief that's completely irrelevant, but it still might affect your decision making. Not as a, I'm to, I'm, she can answer as well, but I sort of think, like, oh, I, I think Trump did this. That's a piece of information, it just happens to not be accurate. You know? So I don't, I don't think... So it's, it's, the, it's the cognitive dissonance and the biases that make me assess incorrect information as being correct in my heart and then in my mind. I don't know. Okay. I, I, I won't belabor the point. We'll talk privately afterwards. And the second question is for the third speaker. Yeah, Andrea. Andrea, I'm sorry, again. Uh, in a ge very general sense, uh, is technology changing our humanity? Oh, and if, oh that's... Um, yeah. I mean, I think yes. I, I mean, it's really shifted. I mean, just like the Industrial Revolution, right? It, it's shifted what we focus on, where we spend our time. Um, in, in some ways, it's been good, right? In some ways, it's freed people up to spend more time on doing things they like. And, and in, in some ways, it hasn't. You know, we, um, I was actually listening to a great, great talk the other day about 
you know, the effect of social media on young teenagers and the chemicals that are being released in their brains are similar to apparently what um, it's like with alcohol and gambling and drugs. It's sort of this constant, you know, reinforcement and it leads to addiction. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, unfortunately. Um, but again, a lot of opportunities for, for sort of great work there, yeah. Yeah, there's no easy, there's no easy answer to that question. <laughs> I have an answer. Oh, well, Corey has an easy answer. <laughs> I think if you don't try to advance, despite the hazards, eventually the sun blows up and it doesn't matter at all. Um, so, like, there's risks, but if we don't take the risks head on and we don't, we should be cautious about the risk. I'm not saying let's just blow up nuclear bombs because hell, it's a technology. Uh, we need to be extremely careful about it. But if we don't pursue that, if we don't look at it, if we don't push harder then we're just stuck here and eventually disappear and if you believe in a god or whatever, maybe that is satisfactory and if you don't, that's really not satisfactory. Uh, I tend to believe that meaning is self-aligned. Shakespeare is relevant because we have decided he's relevant and if we want to keep him relevant, we need to save humanity. We need to not destroy the planet, we need to move on into the stars to protect ourselves. I mean, so to me that's like the ultimate purpose of technology. We can't do it on our own, we can't even breathe in space. I wish we could, but we can't. Not you, no. I can talk pretty loud, too. So, well, we, it's also the hearing of some people, I think, as well. So, uh, kind of two questions, but my first one directed to Corey yourself. Um, being an artist and a, can I say technologist? Sure, I don't care. <laughs> sure, labels sounds good. Are are there are there some some so some examples of software, um, either virtual reality or augmented reality, that is currently really, really good for some for people to create artwork or work with? And are there and is it moving towards in a direction where? it's going to be more and more accessible to people with disabilities of various kinds as well. This is uh, two interesting questions, and actually slightly, the second one is maybe slightly closer to home than you realize. Um, so, I mean, I think it, in terms of art, there are interesting apps. We have like the MS Paint of virtual reality, and it's pretty sophisticated. Google uh, Tilt Brush is called. And, and, and we've put, because uh, my wife teaches art, and uh, I'm on the board of a place called Form Art Center, and there's a lot of kids and seniors, and we've put people who don't know how to program their VCR into Tilt Brush, who are painters, and they do this, and then you go, oh, no, no, it's 360, and then they go like this, and they're suddenly like, oh, my God, there's limitless space to paint. The problem, in my opinion, with that program is it's using modalities from a two-dimensional space. It's like using oil paint as a 3D texture, and it's sort of like... You know, it needs a little bit more to evolve before we have a truly digital art that exists. Um, but I, I think it will open it up. Do I? The second, the, the other part of that question about it being consumer ready. God, I hope so. I mean, I'm banking on it a little bit. But um, I also concede that there's a lot of people who are overly optimistic about the speed at which virtual reality and things like this are going to take off. I feel like everyone thought this current generation is going to work this time. That it was going to be the iPhone. And I think we're in the Palm Pre days. I think we need to go Palm Pre, which is where we're at, and it's kind of janky and only like crazies like me and, and, and really huge technology nuts are into it. Not a lot of investment people say it's not going to work. And then we'll get a Blackberry, you know, probably a Canadian company that ultimately is destroyed by an American company, because it always happens. Um, I'm not actually saying it's actually going to be that, but it probably will be. Um, and then we'll get the iPhone eventually, after a lot of us have been wiped out. Um, the second question about disability, that is something that is extremely important to me. I mean, I, I do have uh, neuromuscular disorders and I do have problems with certain technologies. Keyboards that I work on constantly uh, aren't always the easiest for me to... You can sort of get a little hint of it if you watch my hands closely, but I'll try not to let you watch my hands too closely. Um, but essentially, like, the problem, especially as we get into these virtual spaces, is they actually seem to rely more on your physical abilities. They use touch controllers and motion controllers, and I know the Kinect, I loved the Kinect as long as it didn't ask me to jump. And they ask me to jump constantly, so it's like you lose levels just because you can't jump, and you're like, well, how is this freeing me? This is just reminding me of my terrible meat body that isn't properly functioning. Um, 
It's hard, especially when you look at an advanced technology, because from a business standpoint, that's where the, the struggle has come to. And you go, okay, well, um, I need to hit an audience. The audience is already pretty small and it's pretty resource intense. It's extra investment to hit this other small audience. And when only, say, one in, I don't know what the number is, but one in very few people play virtual reality and then to ask to put all this additional R&D, even though it's already expensive, just to hit that. The problem also is virtual reality currently causes a lot of people, like 30% of people, physiological sense of motion sickness if you move them improperly. Um, and my game is about a flying taxi. I don't want anyone to get sick. I actually think it's terrible that some of these game companies are allowing, like Sony, like big companies are allowing games that generate motion sickness. It's like, how are you going to get people to think this is the iPhone? The iPhone didn't make anybody throw up, except for people who really didn't like Apple, you know? Uh, or like really like people who hated technology, but generally it didn't inherently cause you to be sick. So I don't think anyone should get sick. What we do in our game, to some capacity, is we allow the character to choose their race, gender, we even have non-gender binary terms. We allow them to choose in the game, we have a spouse character, and the spouse can be any, you basically just choose an avatar, so you can have whatever role in that way you want. And then we have adjustability, you know. People get extra motion sick, you can, you know, change the windows, you can change the way the dash sets up. It's been a pain, and not everyone is as sensitive. I think eventually it'll get addressed. I certainly know the iPhone wasn't intended for the deaf, say, but it's been a huge benefit to the deaf and the blind. Um, but it always comes later, and it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but I definitely think it's a concern. I also think there's another form of disability, which is called being poor. Um, that technology is where I'm really afraid of technology. Because as soon as we can start augmenting ourselves, and, and if we exist still in a capitalist society, and only the people who can afford to augment themselves can augment themselves, you're sitting here running on DOS, and they're running on whatever the newest Windows is, that's like a species dividing event that's based on your wealth, and that to me is the most terrifying part. I still think if it happens, it's better that we get off the planet and only the rich do it than nobody, but I prefer it be everybody. Um, and so that's a fear as well. It's not a chronic disability, but not knowing technology, or I even think I can't code, and that almost is like a bit of like a language deficiency at, with, with, within my career path. It's like not knowing grammar. Uh, but I don't, so I'll make it through. Uh, can I just follow up quickly on, um, I think your, your p question about, you know, uh, people being able to do interesting creative stuff, uh, and the, the question of motion sickness, I'll also point to a general problem in technology is that the people building technology represent a really small slice of the population, and um, some of these issues, I think, would be addressed earlier on, either with better input from artists when they're building these tools, but also, you know, we really need to work to widen the, the range of people who are contributing to, to the design of, of technology. Yeah, Google and doesn't the, hire a lot of artists. Well, so. no, but in particular, the motion sickness one is an interesting one in that there are more women who experience it hmm. than men. And so if all of technology is being designed by 23-year-old white men... With way too much money. And we're, yeah, with way too much money, we're going to end up um, excluding people just by design. So I think there are some really uh, interesting and important issues there, too. Great. I'll direct this one at Andrea. to be to talk about we're exposed to uh, um, alternative facts, fake news, and Trump tweets. Are there any people working on... I'll just use the word systems, for lack of a better thing, that will attempt to sort of correct nonsense as it's happening. Oh, so hard, because what is nonsense, right? That natural language understanding, which is being able to take free-form text and um, create meaning out of it, is has come a long way, but it's still quite... Uh, what we call domain specific. Like it, it tends to work best if it knows a sort of the set of topics you can you can be talking about. So there's there's the first the challenge of how do you actually understand the text in the first place? And then there's the problem of how do you figure out if it's accurate or not. And I think we're a long way from that. I actually think the most um, maybe the, one of the most promising 
ways to is, is to again get community input in in that right like get more people commenting productively on and so that's you know that's the challenge right is, is how do you get people contributing productively to news content how do you summarize um, I actually think that might be the quicker path I think at, it, at this time I think it's more fatal than that I don't I don't know that you can reconcile it so say we're in the 40s and, and we had certain opinions about women in terms of how we develop our technology. And we decide, don't let any of those crazy women have their posts show up online, or don't let any kind of minority group that's not currently... And sometimes, like, a lot of this stuff gets backed up by science. Like, slavery was backed up by science. Um, I don't know, I, I feel like it's a Pandora's box to... Like, I, like Facebook's like, we're gonna fix it, and I'm like, like hell you are. like. Like, I don't know, you're going to fix it so that you get more ad revenue. It's like, whatever you're going to do, it's going to be terrible, probably. But, I mean, who controls what's real? I think it comes down, honestly, to the to education. And I'm shocked that it's still so terrible. In the richest countries in the world, with billions of dollars for the army, that we still can't educate people properly. But I, I honestly think it's, like, fatally... Un, until the AIs run us out as a species, and are like, you people are so confusing. I don't know that it's a solvable problem without censorship, basically. I think I'm next. Um, <clears throat> my question is about, and you've touched on some of this, is about the ethics around new technologies. Um, can you guys, any of you, all of you, walk me through, how, how did, is, there, is there a process for looking at the short-term and long-term implications of any technology that comes to a marketplace or to a reproductive technology. It, it just, it, your comments on that would be helpful. I mean, I guess no, I'll, I'll take a, an, an academic answer and then I can pass it along. I mean, I think some of what might have to happen is more retrospective. So after the technology is out, because it's sometimes I think it's hard to anticipate what something might do or how it might change or we think it's going to change X and it actually changes X and Y and Z and we never saw that coming. So I think unfortunately some of that ends up being retrospective where researchers are trying to understand, okay, now that it's out there, that the Pandora's box has been open and now we're trying to figure out what are the consequences of it and if we can figure out what the consequences are, maybe we can put limits on it. So I don't know if that's specifically answering your question, but I guess from my perspective that might be something that you know, people who are working in research might be able to do. I, I honestly don't know how to solve that either. Um, um, I just read in the New Scientist that Google in the UK has, and in some other places, is piloting the ability to, if you, if you ask about being depressed, puts up a quiz, basically, that is used to determine if you're actually depressed. Now, we might decide, well, that's great. Or you might decide, well, oh, there's more data that they get to have to sell back to us. Suddenly there's a bunch of drug ads. That's strange. Um, which one's ethical? I don't know. I mean, if we sort of determine that even though Google's profiting off of this medical information, that it reduces suicide, maybe it's good. Uh, if we realize it does nothing and Google makes money, then certain types of capitalists would say, well, it's not bad, and it's good for Google, so it's good. Um, I have no, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's about being careful. Like, I, I hate technologists that are just like, zealous, like, let's move forward and we'll figure it out. It's like, just, as long as we're mindful and we're careful, if we don't move too fast, we have time to reverse things. It's when we just rush and do stuff without thinking about it that we get in trouble. Um, because, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you could predict, like, the internet it has bad traits, and if we didn't have the internet because we were like, well, Facebook's going to make kids a bunch of self-righteous narcissists, then we wouldn't have all the good things to, I don't know, it's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to add an answer other than to say that I think we, it's something we do need to constantly re reflect on and discuss, uh, and an area that I've become interested in is, um, in, in hearing people discuss more is ethics surrounding um, machine learning. So there's this this misconception that you know a once a machine learns to do something based on data, it's this really black and white process. Like oh, they just learned what the data's told them. Whereas there are people building these algorithms who are putting 
their own biases into the algorithm. So it's not it's not black and yeah, white. If you showed it only geography without America, yeah. the machine would learn the geography that no, there's no America. So so uh, an issue Basically. close to my heart because I care a lot about sort of gender stuff in, in computer science is this article was sent my way from my you know governing organization that. Um, a group in, I think it was Japan, had built a machine learning classifier that given a woman's picture was able to label her as pure or flirty and there was some other um, lovely description of a female. And so the, the algorithm hasn't learned that. It's learned to basically predict these researchers' biases on, on, on labeling women, right? And so I heard um, that with sexuality too, that there's a, yeah. there's a machine that can, with 90% accuracy, determine if you're homosexual. Yeah, but Apparently. when it's actually picking up, or whatever biases we've yeah. we've we tagged it first, yeah. it, right? Um, so I think there, I think this is something that we have to constantly be uh, questioning and also understand how little of it is actually black and white. <laughs> um, looking at the title of your talk, exploring the limitless potential, I feel that there is an assumption built in there yeah. that there are no limits. And uh, I've, I've been dragged kicking and screaming into the information age every step of the way. And I come from a world uh, where what was fostered in me, which I can't sell anymore, were things like critical intelligence, uh, opposition, <laughs> suspicion. I mean, not in a bad way, but always Trying to preserve one's own individual integrity, and like I appreciate, like I'm not no, paranoid about you three, <laughs> but there seems to you be, should be. There, there just seems to be something about the Mark Zuckerbergs of this world, who are so gaga and gung ho, and charging ahead and charging ahead. I just do not feel, and neither does the Congress of the United States, feel that there are enough controls on all of the experiments and all of the changes. Hell, mel and again, I experience. I, I believe the mentality. I, like I, and I'm not being nasty, but <laughs> I mean, you're all incredibly bright people. But and, and I'm sure you are all distance yourselves in various ways from it. But there's something about the the charge and go ahead and the speed. Uh, where Zuckerberg, for example, uh, when he spoke about Facebook, oh, the Russians weren't doing anything. We were in charge. We, you know, there was nothing going on. And now, oh, oh, I discovered. 300,000 messages from the Russians that were disrupting the entire democratic process. Anyways, um, I just wish there was more countervailing force that could say, no, but meanwhile, I realize that those tend to go in the directions of jamming things up and stupid people trying to tell smart people what they what they already know better than, than slower people do. But anyways, I, I just wish that there was a more of a dialectical limit world that was holding you back, not permanently, but at least challenging the uh, underlying uh, uh, mania that I'm, that I'm finding all around. I mean, I think that's a good point. It, I think some of what happens is, when something becomes popular, it becomes so much more popular than anyone realizes, and then it becomes the norm, right? So, I don't want to put a date because I don't. I won't get them right. But you know, when cell phones first came out, they were they were small and not very many people used it. And now it, it's a complete reversal. And so they're like almost everybody has one. I, in fact, I think I read a stat once where there's more cell phones than people um, in in some places. And but I guess I guess to come back to what Andrea and Corey were saying before is, if we can still have opportunities like this where we can talk about it and say. Maybe there are some places we don't want to go, or maybe we've gone too far. At least having the opportunity to have that discussion, I guess, at least is somewhat reassuring that it's still okay to say that and to say, you know, maybe we've pushed it too far. Maybe we need to more, have more critical discourse around how technology is changing us and reflect that it, there is both positive and negative, right? We can communicate all the time, 24 hours a day, but it's probably not good for us to be doing that. And how do we try to bring back a balanced discussion about when should we use it and when maybe we shouldn't use it? I mean, I'm personally more scared of these same companies than I am of Kim Jong-un. Like, they, they hold 
the future in our hands. They, they have black boxes that like government and things can't really understand what's going on inside and they extract a lot of power um, and a lot of authority. I, I think dogmatism of any kind is, is just terrible and I think there is a religiosity to some of these technology uh, people where it's just there is the assumption of limitless. First of all, nothing like we're limited by physics, number one. So there's a limit. Just to, I mean, it's a little bit of hyperbolic to get people in the door, you know. But um, the uh, um, but no, like there should there should be controls. And I think it'll happen. Like like the fact that if you remember when Hollywood, I I'm actually got a film degree. That's how unqualified I really am. But um, the uh, you know they broke up before you know a long time ago. But they they called them vertically integrated monopolies, and they broke up the studios, and they said you can't distribute, make, and screen the films. What we have today with technology companies is far, far crazier than those monopolies were. And I, I think at some point, regardless of what they think, at some point they're going to get cracked down, and I think you're starting to see it in Europe. Um, with like Google starting to get antitrust rulings against it and things like that. Now i got to be a little careful, because some of these places I rely on for my business. But I do think we need to be careful, and we need to watch, and we need to... Democracy is supposed to be the tool to hold all of these kind of things at bay. And it's unfortunate our democracy seems a little sick right now, but you know, that's why we gotta work harder, I think. But I, I, yeah, don't, I, I don't think any of us are crazy tech, just like go with it like cocaine, just smoke it up, just all the technology, you know? Like I think we're, we're very concerned about it, um, but that doesn't mean everyone is. And yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, you know? The whole thing, like they're all kind of scary, and we don't know. We're like three people in Manitoba. We probably have the least authority in terms of how things are going to play out. But I do think that this is, um, like, university research is, is going to be one of the players in sort of providing data on some of the harmful effects of technology. It's not, it's not going to be Facebook that's going to be releasing stats about, um, you know, the effect it's having on young kids. It also looks good. Unless it, well, yeah, they're not going to be releasing the negative data. And so, you know, a lot of my work, you know, we rarely build anything that's a really like, oh, wow, that's a crazy advance. It's a, it's a lot of understanding and documenting um, challenges that, that people are currently facing, actually. I like walks in the forest as well, just so we're clear. <laughs> Camping, biking. <laughs> I'm back. Um, first, I want to say that I'm a technological optimist because I'm going to rip the poop out of the next part of my little talk. I wanted to join this fellow here who just spoke before me and uh, piggyback on what he said, and I, I agree with him. And you've given some of the answers already. But frankly, the three of you, with all due respect, are coming along, like this fellow said, as gangbusters and supporters of technology, and, and so you should, if that's your position. But I would suggest that when you come out into public, that uh, you also strongly come across, and you have a long way, but come across with the, uh, it's not a balanced affair. Um, it's an affair of, of great difficulty for a society. So I made a quick list here. Uh, one is called Progress Trap. I think that's the name of a book, where you know, progress has is, is become not a, it's become a pejorative, right? It's no longer a positive idea, positive. It's, it's, possibly negative. We don't have to charge ahead. And uh, although when the genie's out of the bottle, it's out of the bottle. So how do we control that? I don't know. Uh, another one's called the attention economy. And actually Google did have a fellow whose name escapes me right now. And um, he um, was in charge of ethics at Google and he quit because he couldn't, he couldn't steer the company in an ethical fashion. And he's been running around the country talking about this thing called the attention economy. In other words, no matter how you look at it, we're all attached to things. So if I go on YouTube to look at something intelligent, and all of a sudden there's something about Paul McCartney, well, I'll look at it. And then I'm there for an hour and a half looking at Beatles stuff from 1965. Because the attention economy, uh, we're grabbed, our psychology has been understood and utilized by these companies. Hijacked. Pardon me? Hijacked. Hijacked, thank you. You can help me with any word that I miss. Sorry. But you're absolutely correct, yes. Uh, and I won't be too much more here. Game designs too. K 
Candy Crush and all these sure, shiny exactly. free yeah. play games. Yeah. So the term is atten the attention economy. I they, think, yeah. they want to get our attention so that they get advertisers and we're, mm -hmm. we're selling our attention. It works really well. Kids yell at me because my game's not free to play and manipulative. I've had kids email me and be like, why isn't your game free? And you're like, well, I'm trying not to screw you over psychologically, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of manipulation, um, not only is there audio manipulation of the media, but there's the beginnings of video manipulation. So we won't know what's true at all. We'll see the mouths move of Donald Trump saying lovely things or awful things, or, and we won't know what's, what's true or not. So that's, that's terribly frightening. AI in itself is a problem. I thought this talk was going to be about AI, but uh, the likes of Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and somebody else, oh, with the, the physicist, um, Stephen Hawking, actually, among others, wrote of the thing in the New York Times a year or two ago uh, saying, we shall watch out for AI. Because even if it doesn't come in 10 years or 20 years, if they said if we got a note uh, 50 years in, in the future saying, right now saying in 50 years the aliens are coming, get ready. Well, they're coming in 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the likes of you guys need to be, but I'm sure you're aware of that. Three more here. Um, the power of, um, uh, of data, it doesn't reside with, with the universities with their data. It resides with these companies who are vacuum up, vacuuming up our data and they possess it. We don't possess them. I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, so the answer, maybe I do know what the answer is. One is humility. So I would suggest you talk in a more humility, with more humility. And finally, uh, government oversight. So utilities in the past, like Standard Oil wasn't a utility. Um, you mentioned Hollywood um, and, um, and the like. Uh, they are broken up in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps we should look at um, as Facebook and Google, uh, Uber, I don't know who else. Definitely Uber. And, and they, they, need to, they need to have be looked upon as a utility where we control um, the things that they sell to us. So my, my last line is, is uh, with, with great respect to the three of you, to, to tell audiences about the negative side and uh, think about how we can control some of those things. And I'm a technological optimist. <laughs> I have a counter to that. As an artist, I'm kind of a propagandist. And my game, The Last Taxi, is not particularly like, yay, the world's going to be swell. It's a bleak world. It's a bleak world where the rich evolve, where the world's flooded, it's like, what happens if technology goes on and environment doesn't get fixed, and we just let it ride? And, and I consider it, the point of it, hopefully, is to have people think about what's coming down the pipe if they don't think about it. Um, now, I don't have the right answers. Um, I, I might talk a little bit who's spot, or like, blah, blah, like, ah, uh, you know, I'm trying to be entertaining like a monkey or something, but, I mean, ultimately, technology is scary, and I think everyone needs to think for themselves about what they think technology should be. When it comes to AI, I find it just as scary as Elon Musk. I also think that there's great potential. I think there's a little bit of anthropocentric bias towards how great we are in the first place, and if we even should continue to exist, and if maybe the AIs are going to be better, and let them go. Like, we screw up a lot of stuff, man. Um, Ultimately, I would, like I said earlier with the whole like, Shakespeare thing, I would prefer us to continue on. Um, but I think we definitely have to be careful. I think we have no leverage over these companies. Uh, uh, and, and I see my role as saying, like, like, I'm actually close. I have a smartphone, and I've developed games for smartphones, but I'm pretty close to going back to a flip phone, honestly, because all this data junk. I don't particularly like being stalked, and I don't think most people realize how often they are being stalked. Even just my games, which don't try to track you, some stuff is just really easy to figure out. It's not that hard. And then you have these huge companies that have your email, they have all this other junk, and they're trying to get into your banking, between, you know, when you use your Apple Pay or whatever, they're getting between you and your bank account. They know so much stuff, and now they're gonna get try again in healthcare. I think we want data to help healthcare. I think there's a lot data can do to healthcare to improve it. It's the implementation that we need to worry about. And I, the implementation's not in our control. I accept. Okay. Cool. Get it? I accept. Oh, uh, yeah. Opt, yeah, opt in, opt out. To present the tablet? I think Steve Jobs thinks he did that. Yeah. Who's going to have it? Is this on? Oh, sorry. I pushed the button to turn it on. Is it green? Yes. On and off.
So uh, this question is to all three of you, uh, probably more Corey than others, but all three. When you're designing either software or games, or just even in just the, the early stages of that, what kind of like subject matter experts in the area of psychology and human behavior do you have either on staff or that you're in consultations with? And how satisfied are you with their contributions? Do you feel like you're missing, like, because I'm a behavior analyst, so I'm asking from that perspective. What do you charge an hour? Because that will tell you why I don't hire any, probably. Like, like it's like, I'm an indie developer. Here's, I actually think it's an interesting problem, because you have those teachers who are psychologists who are clearly paid by a drug company, uh, and then you have those ones who want to do good, and they're, they're poor, like, like comparatively poor, yes. Um, and, and the problem is, when psychologists are hired, they're hired to say, how can we enhance the addiction loop? How do we use Flow and Candy Crush to make you just like buy stuff you don't really want? Um, and we don't need to exploit all of you. We just need that 1% who are going to spend a ton and just exploit it. Guys like me, I, I can barely, if programmers are expensive, they're getting more expensive. I can barely afford to keep a team together that's top quality and can compete with AAA studios with $100 million budgets. So no, I do not hire a psychologist. I try to use best sense of ethics I know. If there, so, uh, just a quick response, and I want to hear from you too. If there was, say, a uh, like some kind of a psychology or behavior analytic like kind of small think tank group that would love to offer their thoughts at no cost, mm -hmm. would that be something that you would an idea that you would entertain? A tweet about it. I'd say, look at how forward thinking I am. I have these psychologists. Yeah. All right. I have no problem with that. Sounds good. All right. And I'm curious to hear from the other two. Well, I mean, my my research focus is on is understanding how consumers interact with their consumption life. And so, like, I'm, I'm an academic by training. I came across Corey because we were both working with a, with a graduate student. And so there was an interesting intersection for us because he's in the business of technology. Not to tell you what you do, but... I don't even know. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just in the, in, the, in the university trying to understand how people interact with the things that are available to them and when they enjoy these experiences and when they don't. And so I guess, like, my... Research is the retrospective part, right? It's so when it's out there, then how are people interacting with it, and what's good about it, and what's bad about it, and then I mean, in in the case like the the virtual reality project that Corey was talking about, I mean, I, do, I don't know anything about virtual reality technology. I haven't even seen the game that that he developed just for our research, but the piece that I was uh, involved in was understanding, you know. If some of those stories are so immersive and so, like they, they narrow the focus so much and they're so involving, like a really good movie, but now because of the VR aspect, you have an opportunity to be making decisions, I'd like to know, before that technology is everywhere, what kind of impact that has. Not just at the moment when they're, is it a headset? Yeah. <laughs> okay. For now. When, when, when they're in the game versus, you know, then you leave the game and you're still in your living room or you go on to the next task and there's that sort of possibility for contamination, right? That, that, that the game is over, but it's not, right? There's still this, this engine that's running and if it's carrying some of that game with you and it's not the positive aspects of the game, then I, I'd like to understand that and then when we work together, you know, we can then have that conversation that, okay, you know what? Maybe this is something that we need to spend a little more time looking at. I suppose that slightly defends me a little bit. Like, when I went to make this virtual reality game with morally challenging questions, I, unlike probably a lot of my peers, went to a university and had some research done. So I'm trying. I try to do the best I can. You know, I get tired eventually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my workflow is similar to Kelly's in that um, you know, my lab does sometimes build stuff, but we're not building technology to sell. We're, we're building it just enough to be able to study it in these sort of small studies. Um, my work is definitely informed by psychology, uh, and when I can get, you know, a, a collaborator from the psych department or the sociology department is another group, you know, we're definitely all for that. Interdisciplinary work is, is hard, if, you know, for anyone who's who's done it, you know, there's, people speak different languages, they have different reward structures, different things that they prioritize, but it's certainly um, informed by psychology, and I have mentored some students in psychology who are interested in going into technology and, and are pursuing that path, so there is some 
flow of that knowledge going out. Come on, hammer us. <laughs> Yeah, hello, this is just a point of information, uh, because you, you're touching on virtual reality, and you're touching on art. Well, uh, it, tomorrow and Sunday, at, in, in my uh, area of town, Transcona, they have a, an art festival, mm -hmm. and there's, it's called Bitspace, and, and they have a virtual reality painting, and you can actually go in and uh, sign up and, and paint in a virtual reality uh, environment and Dan Blair is a good friend of mine. Actually. Oh, so you know about that? Uh, yeah, actually, I do a lot of projects with Dan Blair because being an artist, I prefer to let the engineers yeah. run the engineers. But yeah, in Transcona, he's telling me actually about it. Yeah, he, that's the, actually the painting program I was telling you guys about. Tilt brush. Okay. Yes. Is what he's going to be displaying in Transcona for free? Right. Actually? And for, it's free, but you have to if you want to actually go in and paint, you can. Uh, you you have to uh, register. But apparently, there there will be uh, paintings. That, that he has done or they have done, and you can actually go in and immerse yourself and, and see the paintings. But um, I, I guess it's, well, no, because you have to be 18 to participate in this, so you can actually go in and, and you know, create the painting yourself. But it's mainly just to, I guess, to uh, immerse, or, you know, because like you said, you've never, or you did, uh, you've never tried new virtual reality yourself. So this might be, you know, if, if anybody's interested, they might want to go and just experience it for without putting out a lot of money for the equipment and, and that. But I just a point of information. No, that's good. I encourage everyone to try it, become addicted to it, and then buy my game once it's released. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Those teachers were taught to count to seven quietly <laughs> <laughs> to make sure everyone has, you know, can think about it. Okay. Well, here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to uh, do a little bit of the wrap up now, but. Please stay if you want to talk to any of the panelists, uh, not in the bigger group, but just one-to-one. -one. I think we're all ready to hang around for a little bit for that. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and to let you know that the next Café Scientifique will be here in this very spot on October 25th at 7 o'clock. So not quite the same bad time and same bad channel, but this is where it will be. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and for engaging in this conversation, and also to thank our panelists as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>